since we are in a time of uh, transition, I thought it might be a good opportunity to honor uh, some who might be here this morning who are charter members of Beaver Dam. Charter members meaning you've been around here ever since this church was founded. So uh, if you are a charter member, can, I, can you raise your hand? I don't see anyone. Because Beaver Dam was started 238 years ago. We've been on this spot for 238 years, so if you did raise your hand, I need to have a conversation with you after the service. We've got a long history, but because we've been around a long time, we don't have all of the documents for that history. Some of those documents in the early days have been lost, they've been damaged, some, t- some of it's unreadable because of all the time that has transpired, but we do have records for the church that we are going to start talking about this morning. A church that was in existence long before Beaver Dam came into existence in the ancient city of Thessalonica. And so I want to begin this morning, I see some of you turning to Thessalonians, but we're going to start in Acts chapter 17, because that is the historical record of the beginning of this church in Thessalonica. So let's read Acts chapter 17, verses 1 through 9. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and up Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous, and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, these men have turned the world upside down and have now come here also. And Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And the people in the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. Increasingly, the American church is falling on hard times. Some would argue that she just doesn't have the impact that she once did. So maybe it's time to redesign things. Others are quick to conclude that the church is no longer relevant. And as a result, professing Christians increasingly turn to parachurch ministries or social programs or drop out of church altogether or perhaps creative ways to draw a crowd. I saw this morning that a very large church in this country is going to be using their service this morning to exegete, that is to go over and explain, not scripture, but Super Bowl commercials. That's their topic today. They're going to find whatever truth there is in Super Bowl commercials. And I dare say their crowd will be considerably larger than most churches this morning. I suppose we could sum up the opinion of many by simply saying that church is no longer necessary. With all of the buildings and all of the budgets and all the bureaucracy, who really needs it? The answer, according to Scripture, is every believer. In Acts chapter 2, there is a description of the activities of the early believers, and Luke writes, and the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. That is, those who were being saved joined the church, and the church was made up of those who have been saved. The Bible knows nothing of a churchless Christianity, even if that is now popular in our contemporary culture. Now, what does all this have to do with the book of 1 Thessalonians? Well, to be fair, there is a lot to criticize about the church. There is false doctrine. There are hypocrites. 
There are petty disagreements and selfish people, just to name a few. And the quick answer is not, well, what we need to do is to return to the first century church because the first century church had its problems as well. I mean, take a look at the book of 1 Corinthians. That church was filled with problems, and the vast majority of Paul's letters in the New Testament are written to churches who are struggling with false doctrine or false believers. But 1 Thessalonians is a little bit different. Because here we find a church that, although it is very young, it is a church that is worthy of praise. They were not perfect by any means, but they were progressing. And that's what we find in chapter 1. I'm calling this public praise, and I'm doing that for two reasons. Number one, Paul is writing to this church, and he is publicly praising them, so that even now, after all of these many years, we are hearing his words of praise for these individuals within the church. But I'm calling it public praise for another reason, and that is that their faith was publicly on display. That is, the people in the community and Paul, having heard now from Timothy to return to Paul, and we'll talk about that in just a moment, he's heard about their faith in action. And so their faith is on public display. Now, you remember that last prong of our mission statement? Expecting people to grow? That's exactly what we're seeing in 1 Thessalonians. These new young believers are indeed growing, and Paul is praising them and ultimately God as a result. So let's look at the first chapter of 1 Thessalonians. Paul, Salvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers. Remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. Because our gospel came to you not only in word but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all of the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia, for not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Now, don't worry, we're not going to look at all of that. We're going to be in these same verses next week. We're going to camp out in verse 3, which is where we're going to spend most of our time this morning. But as you know, when we start a new book, it is imperative that we get a little background information. Thessalonica was a city of some 200,000 people in Paul's day, situated in the northern portion of Greece. Today we know Greece as one country, but in Paul's day it was divided into two. It was Macedonia in the north and Achaia in the south. Thessalonica was the capital city of Macedonia. It was situated on one of the major east-west trade routes, and therefore it was also on the northernmost portion of the Aegean Sea, being the northernmost port, and therefore it was a very popular trade center and thriving city. It was named after the half-sister of Alexander the Great, and as you probably know, it still exists today. Today it is known as Thessaloniki, and today it is a city of some one million plus inhabitants. In Paul's day, it was a free city, which means it was not occupied by Roman troops, although the Roman proconsular did govern from this area. 
Paul and his missionary team had arrived in this city as part of the second missionary journey. That's Acts chapter 17, which we read to begin with. Now, we know quite a bit about Paul, so I'm not going to take the time to introduce him. Timothy was picked up in Lystra, according to Acts chapter 16. He had a Jewish mother and a Greek father, and he was well spoken of by the brothers. He came to be sort of a son in the faith to Paul. Paul mentored him in ministry, so much so that, as you know, there are two letters in the New Testament addressed to Timothy from Paul, where Paul is, toward the end of his ministry, giving Timothy godly advice for his own ministry. Salvanus is a man who is a little more confusing to us. We know him more by his name, Silas. He was a prominent member of the Jerusalem church, and was chosen by Paul to accompany him on the journey after that famous split between Paul and Barnabas. We should probably see him as more of a co-laborer with Paul, that is, more on an equal level with Paul, not a son in the faith like Timothy, but a man who was somewhat equal with Paul, although obviously Paul is the chief spokesperson for the group. He was beaten and imprisoned with Paul in Philippi, And some even speculate that he could be the author of the book of Hebrews because he was such a close associate, but of course this is mere speculation. The team arrived in Thessalonica after their miraculous release from prison in Philippi. They went to the synagogue as we read and as was their custom, and they began preaching a very direct message. This Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. After three Sabbaths, they were run out. And on the basis of this, some conclude that that was the extent of their stay in Thessalonica, three Saturdays. But I think there is evidence from this letter and others that their stay was actually somewhat longer there, though we do not know the exact duration. They clearly stayed long enough to be an example to the believers. They stayed long enough for the believers there to become imitators of them. Paul says in chapter 2 that while in Thessalonica, he worked with his own hands, which means he set up shop as a tent maker in the city and did what we might call workplace evangelism. He, He plied a trade so that they would not have to support him and shared the gospel at the same time. We also know that while in Thessalonica, on multiple occasions, the church in Philippi sent financial support to Paul, all of that to say that couldn't have happened in a mere three Sabbaths. So they evidently stayed there somewhat longer, though again, probably not a very long time. Eventually, they were run out of town and they went to Berea. The Bereans received them well, but the persecutors in Thessalonica were not content, and so they actually came to Berea and ran them out of that town as well. And then the team goes to Athens and then on to Corinth, and they stay several years in Corinth, and it is from Corinth, probably around A.D. 50 or 51, that Paul writes this letter. Most regard this as the earliest of his letters. Some say that Galatians was written earlier, but that's the only one. So it is a very early letter of Paul's. He has already sent Timothy back to Thessalonica. He is worried about the new believers there and the status of their faith in Christ. And so he has sent Timothy back. And now Timothy has returned with the good news that their faith is growing. You see, the question in Paul's mind was, how would these new believers stand up to opposition and persecution? Would they return to their old lifestyle? Thessalonica was known for its immorality and its vice. It would have been easy for them to return with all of the attacks from those who were against them and who were also probably attacking the missionary team as well, saying such things like, why did they leave when things got hot? They came here and shared the gospel with you, and then they left town, leaving you to deal with all of this. And you can see how that might chip away at their confidence for a mission team that only stayed briefly in town. But what Paul discovers when Timothy returns brings him great joy. 
In spite of the obstacles the church faced, they were secure in their faith. Yes, they had questions and doubts, questions about the Lord's return, which we will deal with in later chapters in this book. But by and large, this is a church that was solid and growing. Paul obviously had a great burden for all the fledgling fledgling congregations that he started. And that's why news of this progress prompts him to write what is essentially a letter of encouragement and praise. Randy Davis talked last week about praise from the Psalms. And here in chapter 1, we find reasons for praise Not only for this church, but for many other churches. And as you know from our mission statement, a church is made up of her people. And so if we're talking about praising a church, that certainly implies that we're praising the members of that church. So again, we're going to camp out in chapter 3 now with that as background. And we are going to see, first of all, that they were commended for their constructive faith. Paul begins this letter in a customary way. He introduces the authors and the recipients. But being the theologian that he was, Paul puts the emphasis in this introduction on God. He writes to the church, and the word church means called out ones. If you're called out by God, then it's only natural for you to be a part of this group. John Wesley once said, there is nothing more unchristian than a solitary Christian. And so again, I say to you that every believer needs the church. And that might fall on deaf ears this morning because you're here. But it is something we need to continue to say. But notice that he says this church is in God and in Christ. Here in the first couple of verses, he tells us the foundation for their success. Why is this a church that he can praise God for? And that is because this is a church that is in God and in Christ. That is what has allowed them to stand up to the persecution that they are going through. That is why they are indeed a true church. I trust you understand that not every church is a true church. Not every professing believer is a genuine believer. But here in Thessalonica, we have both. We have genuine believers, and we'll see why in just a moment. And these genuine believers have come together and are part of a genuine church. So that then Paul can give his greeting, grace and peace. Grace is God's favor to the sinner. Peace is the result. Grace for our sin, peace for our guilt. The Thessalonians had this already But Paul wanted them to experience it more and more and to grow in it. So a simple word beginning this letter turns into a theological statement. And then as he does in most letters, he begins giving thanks to God as evidenced by his prayer life on their behalf. And so this is where we camp out. He begins commending them, and the first thing he commends them for is their constructive faith. James, too, would have been proud of this church, whose faith was not just a profession, but it was a faith that worked. Now, this is not salvation by works. And anytime we talk about this, we have to explain that, lest we get confused. We are not saved by works, and Paul is certainly very specific about that elsewhere. But here we know that their work is anchored in Christ. He mentions both father and son again, though he does not tell us specifically what these works are. He is commending them for the fact that their Christian profession is evident by their Christian conduct. Now, you probably know that Paul says elsewhere in Romans chapter 3, Because of the works of the flesh, no man will be justified in his sight. You cannot be saved by works. If you don't know that verse, you likely do know Ephesians. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we are familiar with that line of argument from Paul, maybe too much so. And you say, well, how is it possible that we might be 
too familiar with that. And I say that because we might have concluded that any profession of faith is a genuine profession of faith. That all you have to do is say the right words, but I want to return to Ephesians where Paul says immediately after the verses I've just quoted, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. And these good works are what God prepared beforehand that we might walk in them. You see, you can't see faith. You can say you have faith, but you can't see faith unless you put that faith in action. That is, there must be a changed life. Faith that works saves. But saving faith is the kind of faith that works. In other words, we are not saved by works. But the faith that does save us transforms our life so that we do then work. And that is what Paul is commending them for in verse 3. Your work of faith, their faith in action, their demonstration of who they are in Christ. Secondly, this is seen in their constant love. In English, the words labor and work are very similar. But there is a slight variation here. He says your work of faith and then your labor of love. You see, with work, we focus on the production, that is the actual work that is done. But the labor of love, the emphasis is on the effort that is provided, the the labor, the, the energy that is necessary in order to love. The word means arduous, wearying, even to the point of exhaustion. It is labor that is so intensive that it drains you. And it is a labor of love. Such an effort is meant to be expended by believers because of their love for God. We know that love is to be the distinguishing mark of a believer. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one toward another. We know that we love one another because God first loved us. And even as we read a couple of verses earlier from 1 John, and John in his epistles has a, has a way of saying things very simply. 1 John among that. And in 1 John he says, the one who does not love does not know God. I mean, how simple is that? If you do not love one another, then you simply do not know God. Because God is love. That is his nature, and it is then to be the nature of his children. So here, according to John, is a mark of genuine believers. Do you have love for one another? And if you do not, no matter what you profess, you do not belong to God. Now keep in mind here that when we talk about loving others, I'm not referring to only loving those you like or loving those who love you in return. I am not suggesting that we love people who are similar to us while ignoring the rest. I mean, Jesus said, even the pagans do that. That's a natural thing to do. It is easy and natural to love people who love you in return. There's nothing transformational about that. But the believer in Jesus Christ has been given a new kind of love. A love for all. Did you notice in verse 2, he says, uh, we give thanks to God always for all of you, all the believers in that congregation. Now, any of you who have been around church long enough know that even in church, there are people who you really don't like. I mean, you just don't like everyone in the body of Christ. There's always some who are so vastly different from you for whatever reason that they are therefore hard to get along with. There are usually some people within the church who simply get on your nerves. Wednesday night, we started the book of 1 Samuel. And in the book of 1 Samuel, there is a man and his two wives that are introduced to us in chapter one. The man's name is Elkanah, and he has two wives named Panana and Hannah. I know that's a bit confusing. But the two women didn't get along. One had children and the other did not. And so Panana, it is said, was her rival. 
and as her rival, she used to provoke her grievously to irritate her. And that is said in the context of the family at Shiloh, which is the place of worship at that particular time. So as they are going to worship, these two women are not getting along, and one of them is grievously irritating the other. And that may just describe what goes on in the church sometimes. But this kind of love is exactly the kind that the church is supposed to display. We're supposed to have a different kind of love. I mean, there are actually churches today that only target a specific kind of person. Young guys coming out of seminary will sometimes be very bold in in acknowledging that. They will simply say, this is the kind of person we're going after. We're going to plant a church in this location because we want to reach the upper middle class in their 30s. That's not what a church is meant to be. A church is meant to be a place made up of all kinds of different people from different races, social economic backgrounds, interests, and all the above. A place where people of different backgrounds come together under one common thing, and that is our relationship with Christ, and therefore our love for one another. That's what is supposed to bring us together. And if we have that kind of love, one for another, then we can get along in spite of our differences. And that is what was taking place in Thessalonica. Now, it wasn't easy. It was a labor. But they were expressing their love for God by loving one another. Now, you do know that Wednesday is Valentine's Day, right? That day on the calendar where we feel compelled to show our love to our spouses. Otherwise, we're in trouble. So we've got to get some candy or a card or some flowers It's also the day on the calendar that if you're single and desiring to have a maid, that you hate it. I hated it when I was in my 20s. I don't love it now, to be quite honest with you. I can say that. Tracy's not in this service. But you also know as a married couple that if you're going to express your love one day a year and that's it, your marriage is in trouble. Love is meant to be expressed regularly and constantly. And yes, there might be an emphasis on it on Wednesday, but you and I need to express our love all the time. And that is true in the body of Christ as well. We don't merely express our love on Sunday when we get together and then forget about it the rest of the week. It is a constant kind of love, and yes, it is hard work. It is a labor that often proves costly, but it is part of what it means to be a believer. And then there's a third thing he praises them for, not only their constructive faith and their constant love, but thirdly, their confident hope. Faith, hope, and love, they had it all. Steadfastness describes a hope that perseveres. We saw in Acts that the persecution was hot in this city. Paul and his team were run out of town, but these new believers remained behind, and they remained behind in enemy territory. So how easy it would have been for them to go back to their old way of life, to wilt in the face of all this. And we've talked about it recently, the parable of the soils. And we talked about how those, the first kind of soil is there's no, there's no root, there's no faith. The last kind is genuine, but in between, there's two kinds of soil where there is initially some sort of life. It springs up, but in one of them, the rocky soil, it eventually fades away because it doesn't have a deep root, and when the sun comes up, it scorches it. And that's exactly what Paul was worried about happening in Thessalonica. He knew their faith was fragile because it was young. They were vulnerable to the attacks of the enemy. I'm sure you've heard of someone, maybe you even know someone, who shortly after they came to faith in Christ had something bad happen in their life, perhaps something even tragic. Maybe they lost a job or lost a loved one. Or maybe they were facing some sort of persecution, even as they were in Thessalonica, where their leaders had exited and left them behind. So what is going to keep them moving forward in their faith? The only thing is their confident hope in Jesus Christ. We might also call this the perseverance of the saints. 
Genuine believers persevere until the end of their life. That's why Jesus can say that those who endure to the end will be saved. A confident hope in Jesus Christ, even through great trials and even through difficulties, is a mark of genuine salvation. Again, our perseverance doesn't save us, but our perseverance demonstrates that we are saved. The hymn writer said, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name, because on Christ the solid rock I stand, and all other ground is sinking sand. That is the confidence in the hope we have in Christ. A confident hope that he has saved us. A confident hope that he will bring us through the storms of life. And a confident hope that he will fulfill his promises in spite of all we go through. We are not promised an easy life. But we can have a life that is built on a solid foundation, and that is the rock of confident hope in Christ. All three of these things were praised by Paul in the life of these believers. However, Paul is not per se boasting about them. Paul is always God-centered, and even here, he is focused on the fact that this is because of what God had done. Look at verse 4, for we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. Now, in the Greek, that's the word election, and I know you don't like that word. I know that word makes you a little uneasy. But it is not a word that is meant to divide us. It is a word that is meant to be a source of encouragement for us. Paul is saying, I am confident in the fact that God has saved you precisely because I can see the transformation that is taking place in your life. God's election of you has brought real change in your life. You are growing in your faith and in your hope and in your love, and that is why I am confident in your salvation. I'm afraid we've been misled in our country and in the South about salvation. That all it takes is a profession of faith, not a transformation by grace. And so the vast majority of people, all they have to do is pray a prayer or maybe take a, take a step toward baptism or maybe join a church. I mean, read the obituaries occasionally. Everybody's going to heaven. I mean, if you just glance at the obituaries, everybody's going. Because that's what so many believe around here because they've all prayed a prayer or joined a church or been baptized. But what does Paul say here? He says there's at least these three marks of a genuine believer, that these things must be evident in our life for verification of our salvation. No one can be assured of salvation based on a past act but we can be assured of our salvation on the basis of present reality. Do we have a constructive faith? That is a faith that works. Do we have a constant love? That is a love for one another because we are living out of God's love for us. And do we then have a confident hope? Not in who we are, but because of who Christ is and what he's done. Now, again, we've talked a lot about the Thessalonians this morning, but they're not here. So what about you? Where do you stand in your relationship to Christ? And I, again, I'm not, I'm not asking if you've been baptized. I'm not asking if you're a member of this church. I'm not asking when you prayed a prayer of profession of faith. I'm asking, can you see these things, these three marks in your life? Because these are three marks of genuine followers of Christ. We have a constructive faith, a constant love, and a confident hope. Next week, we'll see some more things from this same chapter that go along with this. But for now, we need to examine our own lives to see if these three things are present. Again, not that these three things save us, but the evidence of these three things show 
that we are indeed saved. Let me pray. Father, we do thank you this morning for your word and for the encouragement that it brings. And I do pray that your Holy Spirit would examine our hearts and lives to see if these things are evident in our lives. Do we have this kind of faith, love, and hope? I pray that we would be able to say absolutely that we're not perfect in any of these things, but we are growing in all three. And as a result, even as Paul gave public praise to the church in Thessalonica, we can have the same praise for our own lives, not because of what we're doing, but because of what you're doing through us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing and you respond. The last words of Paul to this church uh, is in the second letter, of course, and it says, now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. The Lord be with you all. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. You're dismissed.